In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I welcome you here to this time of worship and praise, a time to, to celebrate whose we are because of the sacrifice that was paid for our salvation. As we come together today, um, there's, there's one request that, that I would have for our congregation in our uh, elders meeting this past week, this past Monday, we were talking about some of the spiritual effects of the ongoing COVID thing and how it's not unusual for a sense of spiritual apathy to just kind of sink in. You know, um, and you just, it, it, it comes without even our awareness of it until you get to maybe a month or two down the road and you start to think and you say, you know what? I can't remember the last time that I just sang a praise song or I can't remember the last time that I felt joy in the Lord or I can't remember the last time that my, my soul was lifted uh, by the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. Um, you know, that's not unique to any of us. That's some of the things that, that I hear about being pretty common in the hearts of Christ's people as, we, as this COVID thing just keeps getting longer and longer. And so I, we were in our discussion, we were talking about, well, what's our role in that? How do we, what do we do? And the, the thing that we came to was, um, Right now, it's a matter of prayer. And so, I'm asking for myself, and I hope for the elders, I, I don't need to overstep my, my bounds here, uh, but I would ask that in your prayers over the next few weeks, at least, if not months, that uh, you come before the Lord and ask for His Spirit to be at work in the, the, the lives of our our church people and uh, the people of our congregation and just to protect us from that if we haven't yet experienced it or to renew within us the joy uh, you know what what, uh, what David prays for in Psalm 51 uh, renew within me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit so um, and, and perhaps uh, perhaps Christ will lay on your heart concern for someone in particular. And if you feel that, and again, pray for them. And maybe just reach out and say, hey, just wondering how you're doing. You know, uh, I, I got a message on uh, Facebook Messenger this week from a lady. Her name's Dawn Albers. She uh, was a member at, at Bethany in Des Moines. And out of the blue, she said, she said hey, you and Ange have been on my mind quite a bit lately for some reason, and I just wanted to let you know that I'm praying for you. Uh, which is a, a real, I mean, just encouragement, an encouragement. So, you know, um, this, is a, this is a crazy time, and that's going to be kind of the focus of our whole service today, is living in the midst of uncertainty and craziness and unprecedented turmoil at least for, for me, I've never been, I've never lived in an age like what we've experienced this past week. Um, and I think the, the, the one thing that the scripture says very, very clearly is that prayer is our, and needs to be our response to the uncertainty and the, the turmoil around us. So. I would invite the congregation to join the elders and the, and the deacons. They're, they're, they're doing this too. I would invite the congregation to join us in praying for the spiritual, spiritual well-being of our congregation. With that in mind, now I would like us to, uh, to hear uh, what Psalm... I, I, again, I come back to this because I think hearing the... The reality of God's power expressed in Scripture reminds us really well of whose we are and leads us into an approach to life based on that, that knowing, that knowledge. So I go to Psalm 46. I find it, I've, I've come back to Psalm 46 
uh, the reading of Psalm 46 quite a bit this week, where uh, the sons of Korah, I believe, say, uh, God is an, well, let me, let me read it so I get it right. Sorry, I'm invading your space. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, so this is who God is. God is our, our strength. He is present with us in times of trouble. And then they move from understanding that with that bit of knowledge and believing that, it, that knowledge leads us into a, a, a type of living. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains tremble, or yeah, or the mountains tremble, that the waters surge and foam. We will not fear, because God is with us. He is our strength. Today, as we come in worship, in a in a week that has been really strange. This is what I would ask us to focus on, knowing that God is with us. We have no reason to fear. With that in mind, I call you into worship as we worship the, the one who is the sovereign Lord of all creation. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, there's a lot of stuff going on, things that haven't been seen, experiences that we haven't had to live through, the uncertainty that we haven't really felt with regards to where our country is going and what may or may not be happening in the halls of our capital. I thank you, Father, that your word speaks to us in all circumstances, and specifically in the, the time that we find ourselves in. And that your word reminds us of whose we are, that reminds us of who you are. You are the sovereign Lord of all creation, the one who holds the earth and the stars and the sun and moon in your hands who works through the course of history to accomplish your purposes, who stands with, guides, and keeps your people through all circumstances and for all eternity. Today, Father, as we gather in this place, I pray that who you are will be known by us, that your spirit will reveal truth along those lines and that in response to that we will leave this place sure and certain and expectant confident and comfortable not in the sense of taking it easy but comfortable in what in the way that we look ahead to a future hope filled as we look ahead to the future come heavenly father as we worship as we sing as we pray as we focus on your word meet with us here take delight in what we say and think and do and grant to us the blessing of your spirit father this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I would invite the, the worship team to come forward as together we turn our attention to responding to who God is, responding in words of song and praise. Will you rise?
seated. For what do you come looking this morning? Hope, a word of truth, encouragement, healing, filling, cleansing. What do you hunger for today? One of the great truths that scripture assures us, that teaches us, along with God being our ever-present help in times of trouble, is that He is the generous Father who gives good gifts to all His children. At this point in time, I would like to invite the youngest of the children to come forward for a word of truth that Chuck will share. in church here, but you ever go into a hotel or motel or doctor's office, dentist's office, look around. A lot of times you'll find a Bible. And that's what the Gideons do. We put Bibles there. And then these little ones, we just give those to anybody and everybody we think of. We, I've given them out to people at Walmart, to uh, Casey's, to Bernard, wherever I can find people. I can talk to, ask them if they'd like to have the Bible. Why do you think we do that? Yeah. Do you know that there's a lot of boys and girls and adults that don't really know anything about Jesus? And that's why we have, one of the ways to find out about Jesus is through the Bible, isn't it? Lots of good Bible stories in there about Jesus why Jesus came and how he was born. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We've, uh, we've done that for many years, you know. One fellow tells a story when he was handing out Bibles in a school in Africa to fifth graders. And that was the only book they had. And while they was doing that, the fourth graders were trying to crawl in the windows because they wanted Bibles too. So we need to get the Bibles in the hands of the people, don't we? To find out about Jesus. So we need to go wherever we can and hand out the word. Now, I'm going to close with prayer. Then when we do, when you go back to your seat, you may pick up one of these Bibles and take it with you, okay? Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we're just so excited this morning about Jesus. We just heard Pastor Todd talking about it, that we need to be on fire. Too many times we slack off. Now we've got Bibles to hand out. We can always tell people about Jesus. We have to be ready to spread your word. Bless these children. Bless the efforts of all God's people. In your name we pray. Amen. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. I knew I was forgetting something. Remember when about a month ago when we had the Bibles for Jesus? A birthday for Jesus? We ask people to pick up an envelope. 
take them and take the little medallion out, put on the back how many Bibles they would like to donate to the Gideons, and hang it on the tree. Man, we had a lot of them on the tree. Do you know there was enough? There are a hundred Bibles in this box, and we had enough money to buy five boxes. That's over 500 Bibles, or 120 of the big ones. And those, we don't know where those Bibles will go. They could come back to Oskaloosa or Lighten, or they could go all over the world. But that's why we do that. But isn't that cool? That's a lot of Bibles, over 500. Okay, now you can come and take one and go back to your seats. this next week. God's word tells us, or God tells us through his word that scripture is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God is faithful to us. He is a generous father, ever present, never leaving strong and powerful, steadfast in his love. This is what I want us to remember today. And in response, knowing who God is and, and remembering what God has taught you through his word and perhaps heard first down in a Sunday school room down there or his word as you have been at your kitchen table reading it, I would invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, for over nine months, over ten months, I guess, the world has seemed really odd. Never in my life would I have imagined that your people would not be able to be together to worship you on Easter Sunday. Never would I have imagined family members not feeling comfortable coming home to celebrate Christ's birth. Never would I have imagined uh, your people wondering if it was safer for them to stay at home rather than gather with your people in worship. This has been a really weird year, a really weird 10 months. The effects have hit us not simply physically, but we have felt the weirdness in our minds and in our emotions and in our souls and our spirits. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know what's going on in the, the totality of our beings. I give you thanks, Father, we come together and thank you for the opportunity that we, we have to be here in this place today, recognizing that this is a gift, recognizing that there are many of your people throughout the world who can't gather like we do. Thanking you for this hour that we have together. But even more so, thanking you for what you are doing here. In the weirdness of this past 10 months, you meet us in this place. 
and remind us though even though everything else around us may change who you are and your love for us and your presence with us will never change there is nothing that can separate us from that nothing in creation can separate us from your love that is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord Father today we come in maybe the weirdest week of a weird 10 months we come some of us empty needing to be filled some of us broken needing to be mended some of us seeking guidance some of us desperate we come first of all knowing who you are knowing your generosity and your goodness Second of all, knowing that there is no place else that we can go to receive what it is that our hearts and minds and souls require to live, not simply to exist and not simply to endure, but to live. Live lives as we were intended to live them. Father, we pray that as we're gathered here, you will again show yourself to be who you tell us you are in your word. And that as we continue to worship by focusing on you and by responding to you in soul, that truth will be kindled. The spark of truth will be kindled and burn brighter. We thank you for the time we have here, for who you are. And we pray, Father, grant to us the gift that our hearts so desperately need. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God has been faithful to us for many, many years. He has been faithful to this church for over 100 years, 130 years close Maybe over 130 years now. Anyway, it's been a long time. Today we get to remember and celebrate the steadfastness of God's love for and presence with his people by joining together in singing hymn number 686, O God, our help in ages past.
seated. In a world of competing voices, we gather now to listen to our God speak to us through his word, recognizing that God's word is our authority in life. That through his word, God directs us and instructs us and shows us and teaches us and fills us with what it is that we need, knowledge and understanding that we need to be faithful to him in a land and in a world of, as I said before, competing voices. Today we are going to listen to Paul speak to us, or God speak to us through Paul, through uh, two letters that he sent. One to Ephesians, we'll read verses uh, 10 to 13 of chapter 6. And then to the pastor at Ephesus, which was Timothy, we'll be reading from 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. So in essence, we are going to hear Paul speak through two letters to the same group of people uh, as we prepare to hear God's word will you join me in a word of prayer let us pray it is uh, consistent and true authority that we so desperately need each day of our lives Heavenly Father it is a need that is met in your word. We ask, Father, both for the wisdom, or both for an open ear and an open mind to hear and receive your word of truth today. We ask for these two gifts to be worked in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ has given to us. We pray, Lord, that he will quicken us and that in the words that we will read together and in the words on which we will focus together, by his working, your voice will be heard. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians 6, toward the end of this letter that Paul sent to the church in general, to the Ephesian church in general, he writes, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. And then we will listen to Paul writing to his protege, a young man named Timothy, uh, the pastor that Paul told to stay and serve the Ephesian church after he had gone. He speaks, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority, that we may be, live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and, man, and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people this has now been witnessed to you at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. 
This is God's word for us this day. In an article for the May, for the May June issue of Touchstone, a journal of mere Christianity, Robert P. George, the professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. If there is not, if that does not give you a sense of his authority and wisdom, then I don't know what. But anyway, he, he wrote the following about what our, the church's response should be to the culture around us that is increasingly progressive and intolerant to our Christian faith. He writes, so flight, by which he means a retreat from the world and into our isolated communities, flight really is not on the table. We have no choice but to fight. And it is and will continue to be hard. If we are true to our faith, then we are quite literally intolerable as far as today's social elites are concerned. And they hold massive cultural, political, and economic power. So the question and challenge we face is simply this. Can we muster the courage to be faithful to, boldly bear witness, to truths that are unpopular among those controlling the levers of cultural, political, and economic power? Are we willing, if necessary, to pay the costs, the heavenly, co the heavy costs of discipleship? Shall we flee from the battle that is facing us? No, George writes, quite the opposite. Onward, Christian soldiers. And so George embraces the sentiment of Ecclesiastes 3, verse 8, that states there is a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace, arguing that this is the time for hate and war. He isn't the only voice saying such things. This week, the news has been full of other people saying pretty much the same thing. The mob that marched on the Capitol did so because they believed that now is the time for people to fight and take our country back. The legislators that met into the wee hours of Thursday morning did so because they believed that they were fighting to preserve our country's sacred traditions and fulfilling their constitutionally defined roles and duties. Those on the political left responded with anger and politically correct vitriol attacking the president, anyone who supported him, and those who laid siege to the Capitol building. Messages of hate and war resounded across our country. Messages that now de that declared that now is the time for all good citizens to rise up and fight. Quite honestly, I am of a similar opinion. I do believe that now is the time for us Christians to rise up and fight. Given that we are clear on three essential points. The first being who we are fighting. The second being how we are given to fight. And the third for what we are fighting. The way we figured, 
those three things out is by turning to Scripture and Scripture alone. You see, we do not have the freedom to do what feels good to us or to follow a social media influencer, a talking head, uh, or a political pundit. As Christ followers, we are citizens of another kingdom and subjects of a king who is neither Republican nor Democrat. We are citizens of God's country. Jesus and Jesus alone is Lord of our lives. His word is our authority. Scripture is, is what tells us who we are and how we are to live. And as we turn to Scripture, one of the places that I find helpful for what has been going on and how it is, how I believe it is that we are called to respond is in the directions that Paul wrote to Timothy and the church in Ephesus. I believe these are spot on in leading us to live in this time as good citizens, both of the United States and more importantly, as citizens of God's kingdom. Here's, here's why I say that I find this, these passages to the Ephesians and to Timothy so helpful. First of all, because of what was happening in the church. Timothy was ministering in Ephesus when Paul sent him the letter. The last time that Paul was with the Ephesian church, told to us in Acts 20 verses 28 to 31, he told them that false teachers were going to come into the church and that false teachers would rise up in the church, teachers that would distort the truth of the gospel and draw people away from Christ. Paul sent the letter to, church, to the, the church and the letter to Timothy to aid them in their battle against the false teachers that had come and had risen up. That's the first reason. The second reason I find these passages helpful for us today is because of what was happening outside the church. The Roman authority at the time was Nero. How many of you have heard of Nero? Right? Okay. He was a cruel, a terribly cruel man who hated Christianity with unique intensity who worked to turn the Roman Empire against our faith and was the first Roman emperor to persecute Christians, doing it with unusual brutality. And so, we see in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church and to Timothy instructions on how to lead a church through a period of false teaching inside and rising social hatred outside two characteristics that are facing the church to, today our the church in America today is in a very similar position facing false teaching from inside facing the reality of increasing social hatred Here is the essence of what Paul taught regarding how we live in that reality. First, in the letter to the Ephesian church, Paul clarifies that the church's battle is not against people, but against spiritual forces that are opposed to God's global gospel proclaiming work. I know it's really, really easy to focus on individual people in our fighting. Biden or Trump, McConnell or Schumer. However, in Ephesians 6, Paul points out a different target saying that our struggle is not against flesh and bone, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, 
and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are not in a battle against people. We are in a battle against spiritual forces who work through people. This supernatural identification of the church's enemies does not make our battle less significant and less intense. As I said, now is the time to fight. And our fight is significant and it is intense. You can say that in all the stuff that is going on right now with COVID and our government and the different social agendas that are being pursued and the moral failings of church leaders and the rise of false teaching in the American church and in the RCA, you could say that we are in a uniquely intense battle for the very soul of our country and our world. That is the nature of the battle that is in front of us. And that's why it is terribly important that we understand both who we are fighting and how we fight it. And that's where Paul leads us next in, in, in both letters. He makes it clear that the way we take the field of battle, the way we fight is through being strong in the Lord, as he said in the Ephesian letter, and more specifically from Paul's letter to Timothy, we fight through prayer. Well, you might say, well, that, that's a pretty weak response to all the stuff that we're feeling and we're experiencing. Prayer! And I, and I say, yeah, you know what? That's exactly it. We don't fight through our own power. We don't take and, and wage war by means of our own strength. God's word is consistent in teaching us that the way of the way forward is the way that is perceived as weak by the world's standards. Because as Paul learned, when we are weak, God is strong. Our way of fighting the war in front of us is through prayer. How do we battle the principalities and powers that are working through the false teachers? Pray! Specifically pray that the light of the gospel would be proclaimed in all places and heard by people from all tribes and languages and peoples and nations. Pray that God would use me and you to accomplish that. Now I know that this church is a church of prayer. We take time regularly to share concerns we have for ourselves and those we love. That's good. And we should do it. Especially when we are facing hard times. But I want us to hear what Paul is telling us in verse 1 of 1 Timothy 2. First of all, pray for all people. I, I, I hear that, I read that, and, and a, a, a spear of conviction hits my heart. I hear that and I start to ask, when was the last time that we, moved by a concern for, named on a Sunday morning, and then prayed for people from another country. When was the last time that we, during our sharing of prayer concerns, named a group of people for whom our heart was breaking with the desire for them to hear the gospel? 
When was the last time that we in our worship service, moved by love, prayed for the spiritual well-being of our neighbors here in Lytton, that family down the street that doesn't go to church? When have we prayed for them? Not only that they would hear the gospel, but that God would use us to shine the light of the gospel and share the gospel with them. The only answer I can give is, I'm not sure. And that I realize, and in that response, I realize that I have been terribly remiss in my leadership. It is good that we pray for the health and well-being of those we know and love. It's good for us to share prayer concerns that include uh, doctor's visits and tests coming up and surgeries coming up. But it is vital that we start praying for our country, for the gospel to be shared throughout this world, for the gospel to be shared in this community. It is vital that we start to pray that God use us. We are in a battle for the spiritual well-being of our country and our world. And it is time that we fight. by prayer. That's how we battle the spiritual forces working through false teachers. We pray that the overwhelming light of God's truth would shine so brightly and with such beauty that people's hearts and minds and souls would be drawn to his truth and away from the glimmerings of the false teachers. How do we battle the principalities that are working through our governmental leaders? Again, we pray. Remember, Paul wrote these letters while Nero was in power. While the powers working through Nero were hunting Paul down to put him in prison and kill him. <laughs> so Paul was on the, on, on the run for his life. And here's what Paul told Timothy and the Ephesian church to do. Pray. Notice what Paul told them to pray for. It wasn't Nero's conversion, although I imagine Paul prayed for that. And it wasn't that Nero would be overthrown and someone new come to power. And it wasn't that the Roman governors would become Christian evangelists and use their positions of power to convert the pagans. Rather, Paul instructed his friends to pray that the governmental leaders of the time would fulfill their God-given responsibilities of maintaining peace and order and promoting social stability through administering justice. And to pray that we Christians would take advantage of that peace and order and stability to fulfill our responsibility of spreading the gospel through word and deed, through what we say and how we live. He instructed Timothy to do that because that is the way that God intends things to happen. <clears throat> Let me be clear about this. It's not the government's duty to spread the gospel. That's our responsibility. That's yours and mine. The government's duty, as intended by God, is to maintain the social conditions that free us to be agents of gospel proclamation. 
The government's responsibility is to maintain order and stability and peace so that you and I can then go out and talk to people about Jesus and live lives that shine with the truth of Jesus so that the people around us who do not yet believe will see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we fight against spiritual enemies. We fight by praying. Paul then makes it clear that we are fighting for one thing and one thing only. That God's global gospel proclaiming work would move forward. Quite honestly, I don't, I don't know what God's plans for the United States is. Our plans are. I know what I would like to see happen. I would love to see my, my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren, Lord willing, enjoy the same freedoms that I have. That maybe someday one of them would come and farm the land just to the west, as a mile west of here as the crow flies. I would love that. And it's okay and good and right that I pray for that. But it isn't really the future of our country that we Christians are fighting for. As citizens of God's kingdom and subjects of His Lordship, we are called to fight for His purposes. And that, Paul makes very clear, namely, is that God's desire is that individuals from every people group would be saved through the hearing of and the believing in and the living out the truth that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, which we all are. God called us and saved us and brought us into his flock, into his kingdom, making us partners in this gospel proclaiming work Choosing to work through those of us who have been saved to reach out to those who do not yet believe. This act of glorifying God and proclaiming His reality and beauty to a dying world lost in sin is both the ultimate purpose of our lives and it is the essence of what we are fighting for. George, the eminent Robert P. George, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University writes that we have no choice but to fight. And I say, Amen. Given that our fight is waged against spiritual forces of darkness, that we fight through prayer and not through social media, <laughs> that we Christians are known as people of prayer, not social media warriors. And that we fight for God's purposes. Namely, that people around us, people in our country, people throughout the world, would hear the gospel and be convicted by the gospel and be drawn into God's kingdom. If that's what George means by it's time to fight, then it is time to fight. And as he says, shall we flee from this battle that is before us? No. Quite the opposite. 
honored Christian soldiers. Let us pray. Father, we look around us, we look inside of us, and we see what's happening in the world, in our country, and quite honestly, who we are and the challenges we face are not equal. In fact, the challenges are larger than any of us as individuals or even this church as a whole have the powers to do much about. But Father, we don't serve and we don't live and we don't fight by our own strength in our own power. You stand beside us. You are on our side. It is to you we look to to take the battle, the field of battle for and with us. Lord, this country, this world is at a it, it is at a really strange point. Enemies are marshalling against your word, against your truth, against your people. Protect us, we pray, from their animosity and their onslaughts, from being frozen by fear of their hatred. Free us to speak and to live in such a way that the light of your truth will be proclaimed and the light of your truth will be seen. Soften hearts, open ears, in all places and in all peoples throughout this world, to receive that which you are showing, that which you are proclaiming through your people. Strengthen us so that we may stand as Paul tells us to do. Strengthen us so that we may stand against all of the forces that come against us. Strengthen us to be your living witnesses in a world that is adamantly opposed to what we know is life-saving truth. We are weak, Heavenly Father, but you are strong. May your light shine in this world, overcoming the principalities and powers of darkness. Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the end of our worship service together, I would invite you to join with me in singing hymn number 435, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Heavenly Father, you have been faithful to us throughout this past week, throughout the years of our lives. You have granted to us all we need for life and well-being. And we return a portion of that which you have given to us. In gratitude for what you have given and in commitment for to go where you call us. Lead us out, Father, giving us the courage and the wisdom to use all that you have given to us. Living for your glory and your will in this world. Father, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his presence upon you and fill you with his peace. Amen. Thank you.